Notice as we look down, the axis of the tool bit is 20 degrees from the axis of the lathe. To make a turning cut, the tool holder moves from right to left. And to make a facing cut, the tool holder moves inward across the end of the piece like that. We are looking vertically downward on the tool bit and the work. A 90 degree shoulder has been created in a piece of round stock. The lead angle is the angle between a cutting edge and a line perpendicular to the direction of the cut. So here's a cutting edge and here's a line perpendicular to the cut. If the angle is on this side of the vertical line, it's negative. In this case, the lead angle is a negative 5 degrees. If the lead angle is on this side of this perpendicular, then it's a positive lead angle. This tool holder geometry is the basic negative lead angle tool bit geometry and the most versatile geometry for the Wimberley tool holder. Notice that the tool has clearance for both turning and cutting. So we have clearance here and clearance here. This clearance is for facing. This clearance here is for turning. These clearance angles dictate that the tool has a negative lead angle. Having negative lead angles for both turning and facing means that the included angle is less than 90 degrees. So this included angle here is less than 90 degrees, in this case 80 degrees, and allows us to get in here and create a sharp corner, a 90 degree corner. In this case we can clean the corner up completely. Furthermore, we can undercut by plunging this direction or this direction slightly if we need to have clear, additional clearance there. The relief angle for all the cuts that will be demonstrated in this video is 8 degrees. The relief angle is determined by the angle of the grinding table. That angle should remain fixed. We're looking at the side of the tool as it takes a turning cut. The relief angle is shown here. It's the angle between this edge or flank of the tool and a vertical line. In this case, it's 8 degrees, and we will use 8 degrees throughout as the standard relief angle for the Wimberley tool holder. I've also shown the back rake angle of 14.43 degrees. There's nothing magical about that particular number. 14 or 15 degrees would probably perform very similarly. The particular rake angle derives from the fact that the total inclination of the rake surface is 20 degrees from horizontal. The side rake and back rake then both turn out to be about 14.43 degrees. Here's a close-up of the top of the tool bit. The nose is completely sharp. This makes the tip of the tool fragile, although the tool cuts surprisingly well in this condition. To strengthen the nose of the tool, we add a chamfer about 20 thousandths wide to the tip. The relief angle in cutting this chamfer is the same 8 degrees as it is for the relief angle involved in the creation of every other edge or face. Note that all of the edges of the tool are typically involved in cutting at one time or another. The chamfer on the tip is always involved. The left cutting edge is always involved in turning, and the end cutting edge is always involved in facing. In most drawings of tool bits, the nose will be radiused. The chamfer simplifies things and produces an entirely satisfactory cutting tool, so we are demonstrating the simplest geometry to make sharpening as easy as possible. Once the chamfer is created, the shoulder that the bit creates will have a slight chamfer as well. The tool bit we have described thus far is an all-purpose turning and facing tool, but it does have some limitations. The combination of generous back rake and the negative lead angle intend to pull a bit into the work, especially if you are taking a heavy cut or if the lathe you are operating is old and worn. In addition, the negative lead angle does not allow for the maximal removal of material. If you don't have to create a shoulder and if you want to remove a lot of material quickly, it's better to use a positive lead angle tool. The simplified geometry we have described so far includes three faces. 
the edges which are associated with three angles, two five degree angles, and a 45 degree angle, these two edges and the chamfer. We can use these same angles to create a positive lead angle tool that removes metal more rapidly. The positive lead angle tool can be created by simply increasing the length of the chamfer. The chamfer goes from being this long to this long. Notice that all of the angles, both the clearance angles and the chamfer angle, remain the same. All that changes is the length of the various edges. The chamfer edge is now much longer and the other two edges are much shorter. This is an odd looking tool bit to be sure. Where is the nose of this bit? In fact, there are two noses. The nose to the upper right is used for turning. The nose to the lower left is used for facing. The tool holder works for the positive lead angle because of the underlying geometry of the tool holder. The side rake and back rake are equal, which means that the plane of the top of the tool, the rake plane, can be seen as rotating around a horizontal line that is 45 degrees from the axis of the lathe. This means that the 45 degree cutting edges are level and therefore both noses are at the same height. Here we show the positive lead angle tool bit in action. In the upper portion here, the tool bit is turning and here it's taking a facing cut. This geometry allows you to take a much heavier cut at the same rate of speed. For example, if I were taking a 30 thousandths of an inch cut on the radius with the negative lead angle tool, I would take a 50 thousandths of an inch cut with the positive lead angle tool. The 45 degree edge does all of the work and is used for both turning and facing. You are simply using different ends of the same edge. So for turning, in this case, you're using this portion. For facing, in this case, you're using this portion. The middle of the edge can be conveniently used to apply a 45 degree chamfer to the workpiece. In contrast to the negative lead angle tool, the two other edges are never used, never involved in the actual cut. The user can sharpen the Wimberly tool holder bit in many ways. The only fixed quantities are the rake angles that are built into the tool holder and the plan angle of the bit, this angle between this and the horizontal in this case, which is also built into the tool holder. Thus lead angles and clearance angles can be uh, chosen at will. Furthermore, the lengths of the various edges can vary. Nevertheless, I find the two geometries presented here take care of virtually every task for which I use the Wimberly tool holder. There's nothing sacrosanct about the dimensions shown on this drawing. They are presented simply to provide a starting point or guideline. The one edge length that does deserve a little more discussion is this one here, the 110 thousandths end edge of the negative lead angle tool bit. This edge is more time consuming to create than the other edges because a large area of the tool bit is in contact with the grinding surface. Therefore, it's a good rule to make this edge just a little longer than the deepest facing cut you intend to take. For my purposes, the 110 thousandths dimension works just fine. The chamfered nose works just fine, but some users will want to create a radiused nose. Here's the original chamfered configuration. And here's the contour of the perfectly radiused nose. If you add two additional facets shown here in red, you very nearly approximate a radius nose. The angles associated with the red lines are 20 degrees from the horizontal, this line, and 20 degrees from the vertical. Grinding the nose on the tool bit is a delicate process. It's best to do it while the grinder is coasting to a stop so you have more control. It also is very helpful to wear a pair of magnifying glasses such as optivisors. Okay, let's touch up an example of both of these tool bit geometries and then take them for a test run on the lathe. The first step is to remove any buildup that may be on the 
rake face by carefully honing it with a flat stone such as this or with a piece of silicon carbide paper. This is 400 grit on a flat substrate. This is the sort of thing you can't do with a conventional tool bit. Gives you a nice polished edge. I find that a so-called carbide grinder with one of the wheels replaced with an aluminum oxide wheel is easiest to use when sharpening the Wimberley tool holder. On the other hand, a bench grinder does a perfectly satisfactory job and is much less expensive, especially if you already own one. Here's a bench grinder with a horizontal adjustable table that I've built for demonstration purposes. I've used wood in the construction of this, but it should be made out of metal because of the hot sparks. If we're going to use a bench grinder, we have to start with a standard stick out because of the curvature of the wheel. Everything has to be standardized. You can use a smaller stick out, but three quarters of an inch is convenient for this demonstration. We can do this right in the lathe. First, set the distance between the end of the workpiece here and the left side of the tool holder. We're using a distance of three quarters of an inch. You can use your dial calipers, but this scale is pretty close to three quarters of an inch, and as long as you're consistent, that'll work, and it's easier to use. So I'll just put that in there. Withdraw the cross slide in order to remove the rule. And it comes out, and I've got my distance set. Next thing we do is insert the tool bit, push it against the back of the slot, bring it forward. Notice I'm not going to use my dominant hand to tighten these set screws even though I want to because it's much more convenient not to have to be reaching around like this. It's also much safer to do it this way. So I'm pushing it against the back of the slot, sliding it forward till it stops, keeping pressure in this direction to keep it in place, and tightening both screws. And I'll go back and tighten the front screw again to make sure. And I've got my stick out set for sharpening. Okay, now we have the tool bit in the tool holder with the proper stick out, three quarters of an inch in this case. And before we grind, it can be helpful to clean the tip of the tool with denatured alcohol or something like that and mark it with a felt tip marker so that you know what metal you're taking off. This isn't entirely necessary, but it is helpful. The grinding surface of the wheel should be cylindrical. If the surface is not cylindrical or if it has gouges in it, it should be dressed with a wheel dresser. This star type wheel dresser is very helpful. It also cleans up the wheel and makes it cut more aggressively and efficiently and cooler for that matter. We're aiming for a relief angle of eight degrees. Eight plus 90 is 98 degrees. We use this 98 degree gauge to set the angle. First, cover the front edge with masking tape for convenience, and then transfer the height of the tool bit to the masking tape on the gauge and mark the gauge. So putting these both on a level surface like this, I have simply transferred the height of the tip of the tool to the gauge. If you're going to use a horizontal table like this, the first thing you have to do is to make sure that the table is parallel to the front of the grinding wheel. You can sight down here and make sure that the gap is perfectly even. Next, the height of the table needs to be adjusted so that you get the right relief angle. In order to adjust the height, we will use the gauge we've already created and marked, put it up against the wheel like this, and then sight from the side and elevate the table so that the wheel is tangent to this front surface at this point. So I'm going to move my head over here so I can see what's going on. Sometimes it helps to have some backlighting to see exactly what's going on. This is not as easy as setting the angle on a disc sander or a carbide grinder, but it is something you can do pretty effectively and get an accurate angle.